Good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's dermatology webinar which is sponsored by Avacta Animal Health. Now hopefully you're all happy with the software but please do let me know if you're not by typing into the question pane on your screen at any time. I'm delighted to introduce you to our speaker for today, Professor Richard Halliwell. Hello Richard. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, now firstly I'd just like to provide you with some information about our speaker and our sponsors. Uh, Professor Halliwell received both his veterinary degree and his PhD from the University of Cambridge. He spent 16 years teaching in the USA, first at the University of Pennsylvania and then the University of Florida, where he was Professor and Chairman of the Department of Medical Sciences. In 1988, he returned to the UK as William Dick Professor of Veterinary Clinical Studies at the University of Edinburgh and served six years as Dean of the Faculty. Now a Professor Emeritus, he served as President of both the American and European Colleges of Veterinary Dermatology and of the World Association for Veterinary Dermatology at the 5th Congress of Veterinary Dermatology in uh, Vienna in August 2004 he was awarded a Lifetime Career Achievement Award by the European College of Veterinary Dermatology. Professor Halliwell continues to teach dermatology at St George's University Grenada as well as giving presentations at national and international meetings. Avacta Animal Health is a UK based veterinary laboratory providing a range of services including sensor test allergy testing. The sensor test portfolio includes food, environmental and secondary infection tests for companion animals. Backed by a team of research and development scientists, their latest innovations are aimed at providing diagnostic tests for you at the point of care within your veterinary practice. The first proposition being the VET AX1, which will be launched later this year. Avacta Animal Health also supply a range of therapies such as allergen-specific immunotherapy, Staphylococcus phage lysate and Duxo shampoos. You can find out more information on their products and services at www.avactaanimalhealth.com. Now, if you've got any questions for Professor Halliwell, please feel free to type them into your webinar question pane on the screen. He will try to answer as many questions as possible after his presentation. Uh, Professor Halliwell, I'm now going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Alison, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, the last webinar that we did dealt with the perennially pruritic dog, and today we're going to talk about the seasonally pruritic dog. And some of the approaches are, of course, complementary and very similar. And I understand that the first webinar that we did on the perennially pruritic dog is still available to you, so it might be quite useful to compare the two. Firstly, how do we define a seasonal disease? Of course, when it first starts, we don't know that it's going to be seasonal. Um, uh, we're talking about diseases that commence and recur in the summer. Um, once a disease has recurred twice in successive summers and gone into remission in the winter, I think we can assume that it's going to be seasonal. Uh, ideally, we want one that's established a recurring pattern with remission each winter. And the diseases we're going to talk about uh, fulfill, to a certain extent, those criteria. First question, uh, can perennial allergens ever contribute to a seasonal disease? And the answer is, yes, they can. We have to consider the threshold effect. So on the left, we have the pruritic threshold. And on the right, we have the... Um, diseases that are challenging that pruritic threshold. So we have fleas, pyoderma, and allergies, for example. And if we think of food allergies, they are not ordinarily seasonal because we serve, serve the same food to our pets year round. They can possibly contribute um, if we have fleas, pyoderma, and food allergies on top we may have to take care of all of, all of those to get into remission. But we're not going to consider the perennial causes such as food allergies because it's very rarely that you have to consider them when we're talking about seasonal diseases. Just looking for how to get to the next slide. Excuse me a second. 
Thank you. So if we think here in the next slide of the common causes of seasonal pruritus, firstly we've got ectoparasites and fleas of course are a major cause. Trombicular or harvest mites are a very important cause. Ticks can be of course year round and they're not a major cause of pruritus but they certainly can cause inflammation and discomfort and if you have multiple larvae affecting an animal they can certainly cause pruritus but we're not going to consider those as a major cause of seasonal pruritus. Chilatiella for those animals that get infested in the countryside where rabbits are abundant will of course be more likely to occur in the summertime and so we will talk a little bit about Chilatiella. Then environmental conditions, pyoderma may be more common in warm humid conditions and you'll have some uh, animals in your practice that predictably will develop pyoderma in the summertime. And of course you look for allergy as an underlying cause. Sometimes you find it, sometimes you don't. But there's no doubt that warm environmental conditions can in some animals predispose to pyoderma. The major cause, of course, is the environmental allergens, trees, weeds and grasses, um, which uh, pollinate from February through to the end of September. If we think of our clinical approach, it's exactly the same for any skin case. And just because we have a seasonal disease, that does not obviate the necessity of doing a systematic six-point approach, as we emphasized the last time. The Sigmundson history, the clinical examination, the microscopic examination of the skin surface, establish a list of differentials, ancillary diagnostic tests, and then the therapeutic approach. Sigmundton history, he went through the last time, and I would advise you to consider creating a questionnaire form that asks the questions and that the client can fill in in your waiting room. And this firstly ensures that you ask all the questions, and B, it does save some time. And then the clinical examination, we must undertake a complete physical examination, remembering that the skin often mirrors internal disease. We examine the nature and texture of the hair coat, and then we undertake a detailed examination of the skin. We will note the presence of visible ectoparasites, the nature and distribution of primary lesions and secondary lesions, and we examine the ears, including an otoscopic examination, because ears, of course, are part of the integument. The lining of the ear canal is an extension of the integument, and the integument reflects itself uh, in generalized disease with involvement of the ears. So the visible ectoparasites that we may see, of course, are fleas. Uh, we may see flea feces. And of course, you determine whether these little black dots that you see in the coat of the animal are flea feces or not by placing them on a piece of moistened white paper. And if they are flea feces, then you'll get a little brownish-red tinge imparted. We may see lysnits, we may see ticks, <clears throat> and we may see trombicula, which are visualized as small orange dots just visible to the naked eye, often found in the interdigital region or the notches of the ear flap. And if we think of some primary lesions, on the left we have a beautiful pustule, uh, on the right top we have wheels, uh, the bottom left we have papules, in this case from a case of scabies, and on the bottom right we have macules, which are from a case of allergic contact dermatitis. Some secondary lesions, the top left, a beautiful epidermal collarette, which is the end stage of a staphylococcal infection. On the top right, some crusts, uh, also resulting from a staphylococcal infection. The bottom left, we see scale from a case of idiopathic cerebrea. And the bottom right, we see comedones. These are all examples of secondary lesions. And when you see comedones, you think of two things. You think of demodex, and you think of an endocrine disease. 
Then we will do a microscopic examination of the skin surface. What can we find on the skin? And we will use cellulose acetate tape strips, impression smears using a microscope slide, and we will use skin scraping. Cellulose acetate tape strips are an extremely valuable aid in the workup of the dermatologic case. And you see on the top left, we have taken a strip of clear tape. We have pressed it on the lesion that we want to examine. We then put it on a microscope slide on the bottom left, just for ease of inserting it into the um, staining solutions which you see on the top right. We will not use a fixative because this will destroy the cellulose acetate tape strip. So we just use the hematoxylin eosin stains and then we rinse with water. We then put it sticky side down on the microscope slide and we examine it under the microscope and we'll generally look at it under low power or 10x to look for parasites and then under oil immersion to look for bacteria and malassezia. And I would urge all of you to use this as a routine approach uh, when you're working up your skin case. It's immensely valuable. Sort of things you may see, on the top left we have a chiletiella on the bottom left, a trombicular. The top right, we see malassezia. And the bottom right, we see a squame, which is a stratum corneum cell um, with abundant cocci visualized uh, with the um, um, hematoxin and eosin stain. Impression smears, using uh, direct impression smears with a microscope slide, are not generally as readily applicable as the cellulose acetate tape strips. Firstly, be sure the slide is really clean and clean it with some alcohol if necessary. It is good for exudates, but it's inferior to tape strips for bacterial overgrowth and malassezia. Here we will heat fix, no alcohol fixative, because whenever we're looking for malassezia, the malassezia are generally surrounded by lipid material and if we use an alcohol fixative then the lipid material is dissolved and you will not be able to visualize the malassezia because they will be washed removed off from the slide. So heat fixative um, with a, a match or a lighter and then readily fixed with the hematoxin and acid. And then don't forget skin scrapings. Um, skin scrapings you really should do in every case because it's surprising what you sometimes can find when you're least expecting it. And most dermatologists will do superficial and deep skin scrapings separately as two separate exercises. We will squeeze the skin site first, moisten the skin with oil, then do a broad superficial scraping and put that material on the microscope slide which has been moistened with some oil. Then return to the same site to undertake deep scrapings to capillary bleeding. So if we think of what we're going to see in the very superficial scraping, we will of course see chiletiella. We will see also scabies mites. The male of the scabies um, is on the surface of the skin and it's the female that burrows into the epidermis. So we will see the males in our superficial scraping and the females in the deep scraping. And of course we may see demodex in the deep scraping. Now, number four, we establish our list of differentials. We have gone through the history of the clinical examination, and the ancillary diagnostic aids as to what's on the skin surface, and we then will make a list of the differentials. Focusing, of course, for this exercise on seasonal diseases. Remember that there may be more than one disease. 
we then have to ask ourselves, can our suggested differentials account for all of the clinical signs that we see? Don't try to fit square pegs into round holes is a favorite expression I use. If it doesn't fit, it's not right. And remember that common things occur commonly. So we're first going to look for fleas, which are the commonest cause of seasonal pruritic skin disease. We may have seen them with our visual examination of the hair coat, but if we haven't, we will do a rigorous um, brushing using a flea comb with the animal placed on a piece of paper to remove possibly fleas, possibly other parasites, but flea debris, importantly, from the hair coat, and it will come to lie on the paper. We then remove the dog from the paper. We fold it into four bits so that we get all of the material uh, centered in one spot. And we then take a cellulose acetate uh, strip, and we can put some of that straight onto the microscope slide to look for Chilietiella. Um, and then we will also put some of it onto a moistened white paper to look to see if those little black dots are in flat flea feces. This is probably the most effective way to really properly examine the fleas on the animal. And remember the clinical signs of flea allergy dermatitis. It is a pruritic disease. The primary eruption is a papule or a wheel, but generally you see a papule and leading to crusting and then hair loss with a dorsal distribution, dorsal and posterior, with um, in some cases coming down to the ventrum. The umbilicus, on the bottom right you see the umbilical area. It's amazing how fleas love to nest around the umbilical area. And you often see them when you turn the animal to its back and expose the umbilicus. Let's, before we talk about flea control, go a little bit over the life cycle of the flea because it is very important to remember this as an aid to establishing optimal flea control. The mating occurs after a blood meal, and a friend of mine stayed up night and day for 48 hours to catch these two fleas um, in the act of copulation. Uh, the five millimeter eggs are laid on the host and they fall off into the environment when the animal shakes itself or scratches. And the females can produce up to 500 eggs in her life. The eggs hatch in one to 20 days and the two millimeter larvae are negatively phototactic and positively geotactic. That means they move away from light and they burrow down towards the center of the earth. So they burrow down into cracks and crevices, into carpeting away from light. They feed on organic debris and particularly on flea feces. And after two molts, the larger third stage larvae pupates. Here you see a cross section of shag carpeting, and you can see how the flea larvae have burrowed down to the base of the carpeting where they have pupated. You can see larvae and pupae in this cross section. And the five millimeter cocoon has a sticky surface. It is the most resistant phase. It lasts eight to 10 days, but can survive up to a year. And the adult is stimulated to emerge by, by, by vibrations by heat and carbon dioxide, so really by the presence of a suitable host for it to gain access to. And sometimes there's a bimodal hatch where the first wave hatches out and the second wave is delayed really as a sort of rear guard action to be sure that some of the population survives. On the top right, you see Tenecophalidus felis, which is the cat flea, which is responsible for almost all of the infestations in the United Kingdom. The bottom right is the dog flea, Tenecophalidus canis, which is found in Ireland 
and in found in some European countries as well. But it's very much a less dominant species. And occasionally Pulex irritans, a human flea, may be found on dogs as well. The environmental requirements, the relative humidity that's optimal is 70 to 80 percent and a temperature of 30 Celsius is ideal. But you know fleas are learning to survive in less favorable environments. And in January in Scotland, I found six fleas on my wife's Shih Tzu. And I don't know where they came from, but they had survived there somehow. None of the stages survive freezing for more than two days. And they survive in the winter indoors or in special microclimates or on wildlife outdoors. They do not do very well, very high humidity and high temperature, low humidity and high temperature, or in very wet conditions. So if we think of the immunopathogenesis of flea allergy dermatitis, there are two major components. There is immediate hypersensitivity, which is IgE mediated, and the top left you see um, some wheels which have been produced by fleas which were introduced to that site. And this is 15 minutes after the flea bite. You can see very clearly urticaria wheels. On the top right, if you take a biopsy, you can see a blood vessel which is crammed full of eosinophils. You can see edema and the dermis with the collagen bundles forced apart and the eosinophils already are exiting that blood vessel into the dermis. On the bottom left, you see the delayed reaction at 48 hours, which is not urticarial, but it's papular. And on the bottom right, you see a biopsy showing the influx of mononuclear cells. There is an intermediate phase that involves basophils, but it's immediate and delayed phases that are most important. Now this means that the animal is going to continue scratching for up to four or even six days after a flea bite. How often does the owner bring the pet in to us and they say, well, it can't possibly be fleas because I bathed the dog yesterday and it's still scratching today. <clears throat> well, that is how because the reaction persists for up to six days after the last flea bite. The diagnosis of flea allergy dermatitis, and, and I think we can say for all intents and purposes that where we have, we have dermatitis due to fleas, we have flea allergy. I think they're one and the same thing, because of course animals can have a flea burden and not be significantly bothered by them if they are not allergic to the fleas. So number one, we've got to identify the presence of fleas and or flea dirt, which is difficult if they've just bathed the pet. Compatible clinical signs, demonstration of hypersensitivity. We can do this by skin testing if we have available the intradermal solution. And we will look for a 48-hour reaction if the immediate reaction is negative. Most animals with flea allergy have both immediate and delayed reactions. But in about 15% of cases, we have only delayed reactions. And so if we're doing serology for IgE, for flea allergen-specific IgE, it will be negative. This is why... For if we're doing serology, the sensitivity of serology for the diagnosis of flea allergy dermatitis is 85% at best. We can have a severely flea allergic animal with no IgE that will be um, certainly flea allergic and with a negative serology. And then finally, response to parasiticidal therapy. And the definitive diagnosis we require all of them those four. Well, fortunately, when we get to the concept of flea control, we have made enormous advances in the last 20 years 
you go back 20, 25 years and organophosphates were pretty much all you had that was really effective. Uh, fortunately, we don't rely upon those now because they are toxic both to the pet and to people that use them. And in the United States, there are a number of cases of people in practices that were using organophosphates that suffered neurological disease. Carbamates are much safer because they only compete reversibly, uh, reversibly with cholinesterase. Pyrethrins are tried and tested and are still quite effective. Uh, they do have the disadvantage of being inactivated by ultraviolet light. Pyrethroids, synthetic analogs, are UV stable and certainly are very effective with permethrin, a very effective product, but you should not use permethrin on cats. And then we get to the new generation of wonderful products which have revolutionized flea control. And fipronil or, or, fipronil or frontline uh, has now uh, gone off patent and there are a number of companies that market fipronil products. Imidacloprid or Advantage, Celamectin, uh, Revolution in North America, Stronghold in Europe, and then Nitimparum or Capstar, which is very effective but a very short duration of action, 24 hours. But a very useful product if you're admitting animals into kennels or into your hospital. Metaflumazone or Promeris was marketed by Fort Dodge, which was brought by Pfizer, and Pfizer have discontinued this product because it would be competing with Celamectin, which is a major selling product. And then Pariprov or Practic from Novartis is available in Europe, uh, not in North America. And then Spinosad or Comfortis by Elanco, which is an oral product, um, really a very effective product uh, given once a month. Uh, a recent uh, publication in the veterinary record compared Comfortis with Selamectin, and Comfortis actually was more effective than Selamectin in ensuring 100% fee control. The experts in in flea control advocate the use of integrated flea control which combines an adulticide with insect growth regulators and these insect growth regulators can be used both on the pet and in the environment or alternatively with the chitin synthesis inhibitors uh, lefenuron uh, which is given monthly or six monthly injection for cats and the insect growth regulators which are analogs of the juvenile hormone of the flea have revolutionized environmental flea control. They prevent the larvae from pupating. The two major ones available in around the world are pariproxifen, which is UV light stable, and methoprin, which is UV unstable. So if you believe that you're going to be spraying using the product where there's access to uh, high levels of ultraviolet light, then pariproxifen is the preferred product. And both of these products are larvicidal. On the top left, you see a larvae which has been decimated by the action of pariproxifen. And the bottom left, you see an egg <clears throat> which has been again decimated by the action of pyroproxifen. <clears throat> so, if we think of <clears throat> other therapeutic approaches, hypersensitization is not effective with the currently available products. Um, it may become effective with the use of recombinant allergens. These have yet to be assessed. And anti-allergic therapy, of course, we will need to have short tapered courses of prednisolone, which are very effective. Antihistamines are not effective, and essential fatty acids may have some efficacy at higher doses. <clears throat> so if we think of flea control, we have all the information and all the products now to get this right to ensure effective flea control. Every case is different. We need a tailored approach. Take a complete history. 
what is the animal in contact with in terms of other pets? Is there a cat that goes out and, and consults with other cats in the environment and brings fleas back in? We must remember to treat all, all in contact pets, remembering that some products are for dogs only and cannot be used in cats. Determine the level of infestation on the pet in the internal environment and the external environment. Now the external environment is really not a big issue in the United Kingdom, but in some parts of the warmer parts of southern Europe and certainly in the United States it is. We consider how to manage each. Is reinfestation likely and how do we prevent it? And corticosteroids should never replace effective parasite control. So fleas really we can get the better of, but 25 years ago they were a major challenge for us. Right, we've um, eliminated fleas, or fleas are not part of our diagnostic um, workup. So what about the next most common thing, which is probably trombicular? <clears throat> this truly is a seasonal disease with a very limited spectrum of activity. It is usually eutrombicular alfredugsi or it is neotrombicular autumnalis. Widespread distribution, the free-living adult lives on organic debris, and the six-legged larvae is parasitic on man and animals causing intense pruritus. And I'm sure many of you have suffered from this parasite. Uh, you go out and lie in the grass on a nice summer's day and you get home and you're scratching all over your abdomen. Usually a limited season from July to September, but I get the impression with the warm autumn that we had this year that this season is lengthening. And the animals are affected for only two to three weeks unless they are further exposed. They are just visible to the naked eye as bright orange dots. Uh, feet and ears are the most often affected, but sometimes it generalizes and tape strips are excellent for diagnosis. On the left is an engorged so-called chigger, and on the right is one that has not fed. Trombicular are easy to kill. They're sensitive to most parasiticides except imidacloprid. Uh, there was a good published study showing the efficacy of fipronil. And remember that the problem will recur if exposure is maintained. If the animal goes out in the same area, it'll get more trombicular until the season cools down and the uh, larvae die. And what about Chilitiella? Well, Chilitiella is not per, per excellence an example of a seasonal disease, but it is certainly more common in the summertime and you will have some animals in your practice that will predictably get Chilitiella in the summertime when they go out into rabbit-infested countryside. Firstly, what is your index of suspicion? Uh, does the animal go out into the rural environment where rabbits uh, are frequenting? Uh, has it been in contact with dogs, shows, to the veterinarian's surgery? Are other dogs and cats affected? Although sometimes, strangely, you can have three dogs in the same family, two get chilatiella and the third one doesn't. And the cats can sometimes be asymptomatically affected. Are there peritic lesions in the owners? Chilatiella and scabies both, of course, uh, of course, will cause peritic lesions in the owners. There is a mainly truncal distribution, and it does cause heavy dandruff. It is usually, yes, gore eye in dogs, blakey eye in cats, and parasitivorax in rabbits, but they are not host specific. And the characteristic biting mouth parts that we'll see, a life cycle of 21 days completed on the host, may survive for a week in the environment, and I think many clinicians recommend environmental control um, if the animals are severely affected. More common in summer months when the dogs are out and environmental survival is more prolonged. 
On the left, you see a Cocker Spaniel, and this Cocker Spaniel had Severea, like many Cocker Spaniels, but it had suddenly got worse. And we've trimmed a little hair away on the right, and you can see intense dandruff from which we got Chinette yellow. They are just visible to the naked eye, and they make the dandruff appear to walk because they disturb the dandruff when they move about. Tape strips, excellent for diagnosis. Very superficial skin scrapings as an alternative. Trim the hair away carefully, moisten the skin, a broad superficial scraping, and place on oil on the slide. Tape strips and scrapings may be negative in 30 to 40 percent of cases, and you may find eggs attached to the hair shafts, and of course they are equally diagnostic. But you will treat if the index of suspicion is high. If it ticks all the boxes but you still can't find the mite, then by all means treat it. Susceptible to most parasiticides except in the imidacloprid. And be sure to treat all dogs and in contact cats. And possibly also treat the environment with permethrin and an insect growth regulator. What about bacterial overgrowth and pyoderma, both of which are more common in the summer times? They may be um, exacerbated by very warm weather. There's an increasingly recognized role for bacterial superantigens. These are produced by most um, species of Staphylococci and certainly Staph pseud intermedius, most strains, and they have the effect of causing profound inflammation by selectively activating both T cells and B cells in a non-antigen specific manner. Also, of course, we can make IgE antibodies against the Staphylococci. So Staph overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth and pyoderma is a major cause of pruritus. There may be an underlying seasonal allergy at the back causing this, so if you see seasonal um, uh, presentation of pyoderma or bacterial overgrowth, certainly work up for seasonal allergy. On the left you see bacterial overgrowth and on the right you see overt staphylococcus folliculitis. So this is how staph pseudintermedius causes such intense inflammation in many of our patients. It can act on the left as a superantigen and good studies in both man and mouse have shown that application of staphylococcal exotoxins which are superantigens will in themselves produce inflammation just by their very presence on the skin. Then in the middle there may be a protective inflammatory response against, again, which is going to induce pruritus. And in some cases we can get the development of staphylococcal specific IgE, which you can determine in blood samples submitted to the laboratory, and this can compound the problem. So I think we're beginning to recognize that the role of staphylococcal um, infection or superinfection in our allergic dogs is of great importance and we have to take great care to control it. So once we've successfully eliminated or successfully treated parasitic diseases and bacterial diseases, if there is still pruritus, then we look for allergies. How seasonal is atopic dermatitis? The data varies between countries. Um, in North America, about 50% of cases are seasonal. In the United Kingdom, it is probably less than that. It's 30 to 40% of cases are seasonal initially, and some of these will become perennial, with about 60 to 70% becoming peren uh, being perennial at the outset. In southern Europe, um, it is probably the order of 50-50, 50% seasonal initially becoming, a, a, and of those 50%, a half will become perennial. How long is the season? Usually March to October, or sometimes just May to September. 
So thinking allergy atopic dermatitis, does it fit the bill? Is it a likely breed? Does it have the right clinical features? Pruritus plus, plus, plus. Maybe no observable lesions in the early stages. Later on, erythematous macules and papules. Distribution, facial, pedal, and ventral. Age of onset, peak age of onset between one and two years of age. 16% commence below a year of age. It's rare below six months. It almost never commences over seven years of age. Are there secondary changes that we associate with atopic dermatitis? On the top left, you see bacterial overgrowth. On the bottom left, you see malassezia overgrowth. I don't think clinically you can tell the difference between them. They look clinically very similar. You'll tell the difference, of course, with your cellulose acetate tape strips. And on the right, we see bacterial infection, staphylococcal pyoderma. The bottom right, you've got these spreading lesions that you sometimes see uh, with staphylococcal folliculitis. Is there an otitis turner compatible with atopic dermatitis? The otitis with atopic dermatitis has very characteristic features. In the early stages, it involves the inner surface of the ear flap and the vertical canal, such as you see on the left. It is only in the later stages that it will go on and extend to involve the horizontal canal. So typically, in your patient on the left, you look down with the otoscope and you think, well, there's nothing wrong with this ear canal. The horizontal canal is quite clear. What's this animal making such a fuss about? That's very typical of the early stages. Because on the right, we've got a more chronic stage where there's involvement of the horizontal canal. Should we now test for allergen-specific IgE? This helps to support the diagnosis, which is primarily a clinical one, but it certainly supports it if we've got positive serology. It helps us to distinguish between atopic dermatitis and atopic-like dermatitis. Now, the latter is not associated with allergen-specific IgE. And this forms about 10%, perhaps, of our cases of atopic dermatitis. Is it the same for seasonal disease? We're not sure. The data on atopic dermatitis associated with IgE and atopic-like dermatitis, which is an intrinsic disease with no IgE, has been done in perennial disease. So we don't really know if there's an atopic like dermatitis with seasonal manifestations. And importantly, it helps us to select the allergens for immunotherapy. Should we do intradermal tests, IDT, or serology? Well, it used to be thought that intradermal tests were the gold standard. And this study from Claude Favreau in Switzerland looked at the sensitivity and specificity of IDT and serology, and they were very, very much the same, suggesting that they were comparable. And then there was a really interesting study done in Texas by three board-certified uh, dermatologists. Repeated intradermal tests were performed by three experienced dermatologists in 12 client-owned dogs. 15 allergens were injected blind in duplicate and the repeatability and re reproducibility were compared. And this is the shattering result of the score distribution for intradermal tests. If you look at investigator number three, um, 144 tests were negative, whereas investigator number two, only 97 were negative. Investigator number one, 115 were negative. So a tremendous variability between the investigators. And if we look at the number of percentage of positive tests with investigator number three, it is 11 plus three, it's about 20%. Whereas with investigator number one, it's about 47%. So here's the gold standard, supposedly, 
assessed by three expert veterinary dermatologists with markedly different results. What about the reproducibility? Well, it varied between investigators and they used something called the Kappa score. And a Kappa score of less than 20 is poor, 20 to 40 is fair, 40 to 60 is moderate. Well, only one investigator, number three, got into the moderate level and the others were either fair to poor. So here's our supposed gold standard, which is intradermal skin testing, which really is not very reproducible uh, and not very reliable. So for all intents and purposes, I think we can say that serological testing is at least the equal of intradermal testing, and we can be perfectly confident in using that on our patients. Diagnostic criteria have been published by a number of people, and, and in fact, none of them are 100% in terms of sensitivity or specificity. And the criteria preferred by most dermatologists are uh, the existence of compatible clinical signs, absence of any other explanation for those signs, and important rule outs, of course, parasitic disease, food allergy, which may coexist, that we talked about in the last webinar, and contact allergy, which is quite uncommon, but it does exist certainly in the summertime. Evidence of allergen-specific IgE and correlation between the presence of allergen-specific IgE with the presence of the allergen in the environment. Some important caveats, all animals have some IgE antibodies, particularly to dust mites, so we will find those in find those in normal animals. So just because you have a positive serology or skin test doesn't mean you have atopic dermatitis. And interestingly, immunoprophylaxis with attenuated viral vaccines will augment IgE levels. So probably you wouldn't submit serum for serology within two or three weeks of giving, giving a booster vaccination. The same is true of endoparasitism. And to emphasize again the presence of allergen-specific IgE, it does not of itself justify a diagnosis. Well, what about treatment of uh, seasonal atopic? We went over this overview the last time, and so I'm not going to dwell on this. We're just going to hone in on what you would do for the seasonal patient. It is likely that it's easier to manage the seasonal uh, atopic than the perennial atopic. We have to think how old is the dog. If it's young, then the season will likely extend and may become perennial as it gets allergic to additional allergens with each year of age. So immunotherapy it is a must. If the dog is older, say greater than five years, and the season is two months or less, then immunotherapy probably is not indicated and we can control the animal with symptomatic medical therapy. Short tapered doses of a short-acting corticosteroid, prednisolone or methylprednisolone, and if we need it for more than a couple of weeks, then an alternate day regimen using a short-acting product is necessary. And this is used in conjunction with a topical steroid. And recent publications uh, on atopic dermatitis have highlighted the value of hydrocortisone acepinate or cortivance, which is metabolized in the skin and has less in the way of side effects in managing atopic dermatitis. For the more severe case or for a longer season, then immunotherapy is a must. And yes, we will include hostess mite if we have a positive serology. Atopica, a, a cyclosporin, is of course very useful. Uh, we may want to use a topical ceramide product to assist in barrier function, such as Aladerm Spot On, um, which has ceramides, uh, an essential fatty acid supplement uh, orally to insist barrier function and supply an anti-inflammatory effect in addition and we must be sure to manage the secondary complications. Now this 
demonstrates a threshold effect. Can dust mites contribute to a seasonal atopic dermatitis? Yes, they can. If we take away the grasses and weed pollens, then perhaps the dust mite, specific IgE, is not sufficient on its own to cause pruritus and the animal is asymptomatic on, in the wintertime. But if we have positive serology, then we certainly include it in our immunotherapy. How successful is immunotherapy? Well, this is the response rate of 100 cases treated with immunotherapy through Avacta. And if we look at pyoderma on the top left, we see that a nil response in only 13%, a partial response in over 50%, and a total response in 52%. Otitis, which of course frequently uh, accompanies atopic dermatitis, similar sort of response rate. And pruritus, again about the same. And if we look at the overall response rate, then complete remission in 42%, partial remission in 49%, and no response in 9%. So immunotherapy is a very useful treatment, and it is a cornerstone of the approach in severe seasonal atopic dermatitis just as it is in perennial atopic dermatitis. Does it work? Yes, he has a nice before and after on the left, severe paritis with recurrent pyoderma. On the right, the animal looks fine. What about cats? Well, cats get atopic dermatitis. Interestingly, they less frequently get seasonal atopic dermatitis. Usually it's perennial. But cats do extremely well with immunotherapy. I'm amazed at how well they do, but sadly, uh, very few clinicians work cats up for allergy, and so uh, the number of cats given immunotherapy is too small, much too small. But this was 18 cases, a retrospective study at Avacta, and every one showed some response with 22% uh, moderate, 22% um, good, 28% excellent, 28% total resolution. Secondary complications must be managed, and this was a paper uh, from the University of Edinburgh um, documenting how common the secondary complications are, assessing by tape strips and lesion cytology, and possibly also assessing uh, the level of hypersensitivity to staph, which we can do by serology, and to malassezia, which we can do by serology. Therapy for bacterial overgrowth and pyoderma. With the rapid emergence of multi-resistant staph, where possible, we should be using topical therapy and shampoo therapy, which is very, very effective. Reserving antibiotics for severe cases or for deep pyoderma. For malassezia overgrowth, uh, chlorhexidine, and uh, ketoconazole and itraconazole are effective. And I prefer to use shampoo therapy to which most animals will respond. If we have allergy to malassezia, can we give immunotherapy? Well, people are looking at this, but at the moment there is no documented um, evidence to support its efficacy. If we have staphylococcus specific IgE, can we hypersensitize for that? Yes, we can with um, the product um, that is marketed from Delmont Laboratories, um, Staphylococcus lysate, that's marketed through Avacta. That is indicated if you have staphylococcus specific IgE. Shampoo therapy, terribly important. Every animal should leave your office with one or more shampoos. They are effective in removing allergen, which gains access percutaneously, in controlling pruritus, controlling inflammation, controlling bacteria, controlling malassezia, severia, and helping repair the barrier. So there's no one shampoo that does all of these things. And if you are using, say, Malaseb for malassezia uh, and for staphylococcal infection, once that is controlled, you might want to consider 
using another one, um, such as Alamil shampoo by Vierbach, which controls inflammation and helps prevent the um, colonization of the staphylococci and also helps repair the barrier function. So you don't stick with the same shampoo forever. The disease changes, and so your shampoo indication will change. Each case is, of atopic, each case is different. Each calls for a tailored approach. Hypersensitization is the cornerstone of the approach. Mild cases we can control with low-dose alternate day corticosteroids and other supportive therapy. The disease will change in time, requiring adjustments to therapy. Communicate effectively, remember the whole picture, and emphasizing, again, every patient will require multiple therapies. None on their own will manage the problem. And finally, don't forget that there may be more than one disease responsible for the clinical signs. So don't take shortcuts. Ensure that you work the case up thoroughly and be sure everything fits and we've uncovered all diseases pertaining to the problem. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor. Um, on behalf of Webinar Club, I'd like to thank you for a fantastic webinar, really, really useful. Um, we do have some questions for you, um, so we will try and get through as, as many as possible. Uh, the first question that I have is, how important is it to withdraw oral antihistamine and or corticosteroid treatment prior to testing? Um, if you are doing intradermal tests, it, it is more important than if you're doing serology. Serology is perfectly reliable if your animal is on low-dose corticosteroids and if the animal is on a topica, the indications we have so far is that you can still go ahead and undertake serology and it will be valid. Skin testing is more susceptible, of course, to antihistamines and to corticosteroids. With serology, uh, there is less inhibition. Okay, uh, next question. Um, I've got a case for you. Um, it's, the lady says, even on immunotherapy, uh, her dog became pruritic plus 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 um, about halfway through the second vial. Would you advise that she continue or try atopica instead? This is an interesting situation and you'll quite often find that uh, initially you get a good result and then you work your way up uh, and the animal relapses and becomes very pruritic. Oftentimes, you will get an enhanced response if you lower the dose way back to almost uh, half of what you'd be giving in halfway through your first vial and give that perhaps once a week rather than once a month. So giving low doses more frequently, you'll often get an enhanced result. And indeed, there was one study in the United States that just cases that, such as you described uh, by Eddie Rosser, who titrated down the doses in all the animals that were not responding, and every one eventually responded, but sometimes uh, he had to give down to one hundredth of the usual maintenance dose. So reducing the dosage and giving it more frequently is what I would advocate in such a case. Okay, uh, another one. Um, do you clip the area before scraping or trim the hair at all? Trim the hair with scissors. If you take clippers to it, then certainly if you've got chilettiella, you'll clip away all the chilettiella. But just trim with a pair of scissors. Okay, um, can allergies develop as the animal gets older, as with people? Uh, yes, and they can get worse older, but as I mentioned at the beginning, seven is the cutoff point. If you are not suffering from atopic dermatitis by the age of seven, then you will not develop atopic dermatitis. Now, in the young dog, it can develop additional allergies as it matures. And generally speaking, the spectrum of allergies stabilizes between two and three years of age. So if you start perhaps giving immunotherapy in a dog that's one to two years of age, it may develop additional allergies in the next 12 months. and You may have to retest it and adjust the allergy um, vaccine. 
Okay, um, could staphylococcal specific IgE be used or developed into a treatment for staphylococcal infections as an alternative to antibiotics? Very good question. Um, people are looking at this right now. Uh, I mean, anything we can do to limit the use of antibiotics is going to put us in, in, in good stead. I mean, in the United States, it's worse than here. Um, most dermatologists find in the United States that more than half the patients that come to see them have multi-resistant staph, uh, whereas it's fortunately not as bad here yet. Um, at the moment, all we know is that staphylococcophage lysate has been used in the treatment prevention of idiopathic recurrent um, staphylococcal pyoderma, and this was a placebo-controlled study. So I think that there is certainly room for the development of staphylococcal vaccines to enhance immunity, um, but at the moment I think this is a science that's it's, that is in its infancy. Okay, um, what should you do if a topica consistently causes a CAD dog to vomit? Um, it's quite uncommon for it to consistently cause uh, vomiting. In, in my experience, I suppose you can um, give an antiemetic, a suitable antiemetic, along with it. Um, normally, they get used to it after two or three days, but if giving an antiemetic doesn't um, stop it from vomiting uh, and the vomiting persists, then you have no alternative but to discontinue the drug. Okay, um, we just have, there's a little note here just to say apparently Promaris and Promaris Duo are still available in the EU, including the UK. Uh, it's just the US that they've been discontinued in, so that was just a note from Pfizer. Oh, that's interesting. Um, just a little caveat, Promaris Duo does cause um, a reasonably high incidence of pemphigus foliasis like drug eruption. So I think that was a, another reason why they were contemplating discontinuing it, but um, no, that's interesting. I, I don't know if it's going to stay available within the European Union. Um, that's, I suppose, just up to Pfizer. Okay. Um, another question. Um, how is a skin test for flea allergy dermatitis carried out? Oh, um, it's just an intradermal injection. You can actually buy flea antigen uh, from suppliers of allergen extract and you know particularly if you're in the south of the United Kingdom it, it's quite useful to have um, flea antigen available and it's just an intradermal injection 120th of a cc intradermally with a histamine positive control and a saline negative control and some practitioners who don't do full intradermal skin testing like to use flea allergy, uh, intradermal testing, and it's very simple to do. And you will, of course, look both for the immediate reaction, 15 minutes, and if that's negative, you go back to the same site and look for a delayed reaction at 48 hours. Okay, uh, just a couple more uh, questions for you, Professor, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. How young can you do serology with a view to doing immunotherapy? Well, that goes back to the question we had before as to when the sort of allergen profile stabilizes, which is at two to three years of age. So um, if you've got a severely affected animal and you test it at a year of age, certainly I wouldn't think of doing it until it's been through a whole allergy season. So I would not probably think of doing it before 15 months of age. Um, and that should be fine, but you may have to repeat the, the serology a year later to see if it's got any additional sensitivities. Okay, um, I think we've just got one final question. Um, what should the schedule be for immunotherapy in seasonal dermatitis? Should it be throughout the year or just in season? Uh, and should the amounts or frequency increase during the season? That, that's a very good question. Thank you for raising that one. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of sort of folklore about immunotherapy and not enough science about it. I, I think what most people would do if it's seasonal, a seasonal disease and you're giving immunotherapy for it, 
you will extend the interval um, during the out the down season, if you want, during the winter time. Um, give them say every six weeks, every eight weeks, and then getting towards the season, go back to your new uh, your normal regimen. But don't stop uh, completely, or you would have to recommence with a lower dose. Okay, well, I think that's that's all the questions. Um, so thank you once again, Professor Halliwell. Thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs> um, I hope everybody enjoyed the webinar. Uh, we've had some really good comments coming in, so thank you for those. Um, the recording and the certificate for today's webinar will be available in the next few days, and we'll send you an email when they're ready. Uh, there'll also be a special offer um, from Avactor Animal Health included in the emails too. So thank you very much all for attending. That's the end of the webinar.